Greetings! This is a lecture about alternating projection onto convex sets. The alternating got lost somewhere, so we're left with the acronym Projection onto Convex Sets, POX. We will talk about it as a very interesting and useful tool in signal synthesis and analysis. It does turn out that when you apply POX to specific problems, it works incredibly well. For other problems, it doesn't work. So one needs to find the problems to which POX is applicable in order to use it. So here is on the next slide a listing of the contents for this presentation. We'll attempt to develop POX from a geometrical intuitive insight. We'll be able to understand what happens in POX in a Euclidean sort of space. And then we will extend it uh, in terms of the mathematics to higher dimensional Hilbert spaces. So we'll talk about what are convex sets, what are projections, and what exactly is POX. After we establish the fundamental theory, we'll look at some of the applications, and they are many. We'll talk about historically one of the first popularized applications of POX, which is the Popolis Gershberg algorithm. Then we'll talk about neural network associated memory. We'll talk about resolution at sub-pixel levels, how you can take a really, really bad camera, and if you take enough pictures with a really, really bad camera, you can get a very good high-resolution image, believe it or not. We'll also talk about um, uh, radiation oncology, wherein a tumor is irradiated from a number of different directions using uh, x-rays. And, of course, what we would like to do is we would like to sculpt the beam of the x-rays in such a fashion as to, um, as to irradiate the cancerous beam without disturbing the surrounding tissue, especially if the target tumor has a strange sort of shape. So how do we do this? We'll actually see that POX allows us to have a very, very nice solution to this. We'll look at JPEG-MPEG repair. Uh, JPEG is a way of encoding images. What happens if you have blocks of pixels that are dropped from an image in transmission? Is there a way where we can actually uh, restore the lost pixels using the pixels that remain? We'll see that indeed this is possible in certain instances when we use POX. Then we'll talk about missing sensor restoration. Suppose one has a number of distributed sensors, such as vibration sensors on a jet engine, and they are uh, dispersed throughout the jet engine. Their readings are going to be correlated. They're going to be related to each other, aren't they? And so the question is, can we capture this interrelation in such a manner that if we lose one or more of the sensors to, just due to functional failure, is it, indeed is it indeed possible for us to restore the missing signal from those that remain? And we'll see that indeed in the instance that we look at that that is possible. Now, POX is very well developed for this case of convex sets but it can also be applied to non-convex sets. And this is generalized alternating projections. The theory here is not as well developed, but it seems to work. And we'll look at a couple of applications of generalized projection onto non-convex set for the specific case of ambiguity function synthesis and uh, the Gershberg-Saxton algorithm. Now, the ambiguity function synthesis has to do with synthesizing a radar signal that has some certain properties uh, insofar as its detection of a, the velocity and the position of a target aircraft. The Gershberg-Saxton algorithm is a technique which is used to uh, determine phase giving magnitude and variations of the Gershberg-Saxton algorithm were used, for example, in the correction of the initial misfocusing of lenses on the Hubble telescope. And we will, we will address the Gershberg-Saxton algorithm also. So let's get started. Uh, next slide shows uh, a little spheroid on the bottom. And this turns out to be a convex set. And we ask ourselves, what is the definition of a convex set? Well, in a vector space, a set C is convex if for every value of x, 
in the convex set and y in the convex set, then lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y is in the convex set also, as lambda varies between 0 and 1. The meaning of this statement is better understood if we look at a geometrical interpretation, which is on the next slide. We see that if we have x in this spheroid on the bottom and y in this spheroid at the bottom, that the locus of points lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y correspond to the Leiden segment that connects x with y. So we have the connection of x with y, and as lambda is changed as we, as we turn that knob of lambda from 0 to 1, we actually traverse this line segment. So you can see at lambda is equal to 0, we are at y aren't we? That's what the math tells us. And for lambda is equal to 1, we are at the x value. And for lambda is equal to half, we're at the midpoint between x and y. Now, this relationship has to be true no matter what values of x and y you choose within the convex set. So no matter what values of x and y I choose within a convex set, the relationship of the line segment being subsumed totally in the convex set has to be true no matter what values of x and y we choose. If there is a x and a y in the set so that the line segment connecting the two does not lie within the set, maybe a little piece of the line segment lies external to the set, then the set is not convex. So this, this defines the convex set, at least geometrically. Now we can see on the uh, next slide that there are many, many different types of convex sets. We have convex sets of the uh, uh, rounded square of uh, line segment. Yeah, a line segment is a convex set, because if you take a line and you take any two points within the line, that line segment is also within the larger line. Um, and they're two-dimensional convex sets, three-dimensional convex sets, and we can generalize the convexity to an arbitrarily large dimension. Next slide on the bottom, we see sets which are not convex. We see the star on the left because we can choose a value of x and y, and we connect the line segment, and part of the line segment is external to the set. Same thing for the torus, the annulus that we see here, the donut-shaped um, figure that if we choose two values of x and y and draw the line segment, then, yeah, the middle part isn't totally within that donut, is it? So, therefore, it's not convex. Last, we have kind of the crescent moon on the right, similar sort of thing. We can choose a value of x and a value of y, and the value of the line segment that connects the two is not totally subsumed within the convex set, so we are uh, in the situation of not having a convex set. However, for all of the figures on the top, no matter what value of x and y you choose, that line segment will be included in the convex set. So let's look at signals, uh, very simple signals, and how they might be interpreted as elements of a convex set. Let's first of all look at a discrete signal with only three points. Why three points? Because we can plot it in three dimensions and kind of understand what's going on. We're going to look at the set of signals, x of n, such that the values of x and n are bounded between a lower bound of 0 and an upper bound of u for n is equal to 1, 2, and 3. As you can see here in the plot, we have three, a three-point signal, and all three points are within the interval from 0 to u, so it is indeed a bounded signal. Now, if we look at on the next slide, all of the elements that are bounded between 0 and 1, we get a box. In other words, we're, what we're doing is taking the values of x1, x2, and x3 and treating them as x, y, z components. And if these are x, y, z components, then all of the elements that are within this convex set must lie within the box. Now you can see that the smaller box there which is included, uh, defines the coordinate x, which is the bounded signal on the left, and it is indeed within the convex set. So you can see this set of signals, x of n, that is bounded, forms a convex set, as we might expect. Now the next slide shows the generalization of this to a higher dimensions, to a continuous signal, if you will. 
we have a set of signals x of t such that x of t is bounded between a lower and an upper limit. It turns out in a very high dimensional space that this also corresponds to a convex set and that convex set in the higher dimension can be thought of as a, uh, as a box, if you will. Now, look at the bottom if you don't visualize 20 or 30 dimensions or an infinite number of dimensions, if you will. If we have a signal that lies between the lower value of L and the upper value of U, if we take a convex combination of them, as shown in the bottom of equation, lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, if we take a convex combination and x and y are bounded, then that convex com combination is also going to be bounded. So even though our visualization might abandon us in higher dimensions, we can see that indeed the math works very nicely and that we do have a convex set in accordance to our definition of convexity. And this is true of any two bounded signals. That convex combination, the lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, as lambda goes between 0 and 1, is always going to be within the set of bounded signals. So this is an example in our first example of a very simple signal set that corresponds to a convex set. Here's another example. We'll start with a simple three-point example again, but this is uh, the convex set known as identical middles. For the set that we have shown, we're going to look at the set of signals such that the third point in the set of three points is always equal to one. So the first two points can be anything that you want to, but the third point has to be equal to 1. Now, now, does that correspond to a convex set? And the answer is yes, as we see in the geometry uh, shown uh, on the bottom right, that if we look at all of the signals that have 1 as a value of x3, you notice that that corresponds to a plane which is parallel to the x1, x2 axis. And x, which is the signal on the left, lies within this plane. And indeed, we do have a, uh, a nice convex set in the form of a plane. Planes and lines are convex sets. Because if you take a plane and you take two points in the plane and you connect those two points, you are going to end up with a line segment which is totally subsumed, totally included in the plane. So, this is a second example of a convex set, identical middles where a portion of the signal is fixed uh, for some sort of, um, in some sort of specified interval. This generalizes to continuous time signals where x of t is equal to c of t, uh, where, a, where c of t is some given function within some interval um, script t. And so we see here two examples. Here's x of t and here's y of t. And you'll notice both of those have c of t in the middle over the interval of script t. Therefore, we have a set of signals and is the set of signals convex? And the answer is indeed yes. Because if we take lambda times the first x of t, plus 1 minus lambda times the y of t shown, as long as those middles are identical, the summation of the two is also going to have c of t as a middle, isn't it? And we can see again, even though our geometrical insight abandons us, we can indeed establish through the math and the definition of the convex set that indeed the set of identical middle signals forms a convex set. Indeed, in higher dimensions, it forms a plane. Our third example, as you can see on the next slide, is a fixed area signal. And here we have our three-point signal. Why do we choose our three-point signal? So we can interpret it in, two, or in three dimensions. We're going to choose the set such that the sum of all three of the points is equal to a constant a like the set of the three points must add up to, to 1 or 7 or some fixed number. And we maintain that this is also a convex set. Let's look at the geometry associated with x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to a constant. It turns out to be the uh, type of simplex that is shown on the bottom right. Uh, 
So all of the values here, x1, x2, and x3, add up to 1. And if we have a point which adds up to 1, or a signal that adds up to 1, then that signal can be viewed as a vector which lies in this convex set. Now this plane extends beyond this octant that we have here. It goes, it extends uh, through the different planes and extends forever. But I think you can see that it is indeed a plane, and planes correspond to convex sets. Because again, if you choose two points, and those two points are within a plane, then um, the line segment connecting the two points is going to be totally included or subsumed within the plane. We can generalize this to higher dimensions, saying that, uh, as you see on this slide, that if we define x of t as a element of a convex set such that the integral over a specified area of x of t is equal to a constant, then we have a convex set. And this can be easily shown, uh, as, f as you can see with the figures shown on the bottom. We have two signals. One has an area of a x of t, the other one has an area of a, y of t, and then a simple integral calculus shows that if we take lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y and integrate it over that interval, we do indeed get a back, because we get lambda times the area plus 1 minus lambda times the area, so indeed we do get the area. So again, even though our, our dimensional insight has abandoned us, possibly, we see that, indeed, that the mathematical definition of the convex set allows us to define the set of all signals with constant area over a fixed interval as equal to a, a type of convex set. Notice all of these convex sets are parameterized. Here we have the set parameterized by the area A. You, ch you change the area of A, you change the convex set. Previously, we had the um, we had that for the identical middles that the identical middles was fixed. Now, if you change the identical middle from one identical middle to another one, you've changed the convex set. So all of them have parameters or fixed numbers associated with uh, with the convex set. Here's the one which is interesting and makes a lot of sense, and this is the bounded energy signals. The energy of a signal is typically thought of as the sum of the squares in a discrete signal. And so we have a three-dimensional signal, x1, x2, x3. If we square them and we allow them to be less than or equal to uh, some fixed energy, energy in this case is the parameter of the convex set, then indeed we have a convex set here. So this turns out, as you might imagine, to be a convex set. In fact, the set of all signals so that the sum of the squares is less than or equal to the energy is a sphere, as depicted here on the bottom. And the radius of the sphere is E, whatever the energy is. So we can see the sphere is a convex set, so therefore the set of all uh, bounded energy signals is also a convex set. Now, in order to prove the, um, the set of all bounded energy signals is a convex set, we need to apply something which is referred to as the triangle inequality. If you're not familiar with the triangle equality, just rest assured that a sphere is indeed a convex set. But if you're interested in the triangle inequality, you can see that the triangle inequality dictates that the sphere is indeed a convex set. And again, we are saved by the mathematics because our intuition to higher dimensions might be compromised in some way. Next slide. We have something uh, which in electrical engineering we use a lot. Uh, this is a so-called band-limited signal. A band-limited signal is defined as a signal whose Fourier transform is zero outside of some sort of fixed interval. B is the bandwidth of the signal. Now, if x of t is a band-limited signal, and y of t is a band-limited signal, then so is lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. So if you add two band-limited signals together, you get a third band-limited signal. It's kind of obvious. It does turn out that this band-limited signal is a plane, or the convex set corresponding to this band-limited signal is a plane. 
And so we have another set of signals that form a convex set. So you can see the idea of convexity in signal classes is something which is relatively ubiquitous. There are a lot of signal classes which are not convex, but you can see these, which are commonly used, are indeed convex. Here's one where we'll actually use it in, here's one which we will actually use in tomography. Uh, it's a tomographic projection. Imagine, as you can see here, a two-dimensional image. And this two-dimensional image has a certain line which goes through it. This line can be thought of as a slice of the image, and the projection corresponding to this line is the summing up of all of the pixels along this projection. And the summing up of all these pixels along this projection correspond to p, little p. So the line segment itself is parameterized by p. The sum of the pixels along the line is indeed p. Now, here is the claim. The set of all images which have the same projection along this same line correspond to a convex set. In fact, it's kind of the special case of constant area convex sets. Let's take a look here on the next slide where we have two different images. We have the image on the left, which is F1. We have the image on the right, which is F2. And we have a slice along the same orientation of a line called cap P. In both of these cases, the, the summation of the pixels along this line, or the line integral in the continuous case, has a value of P. So the line integral along this fixed line has a value of P for both F1 and F2. Well, if this is indeed the case, then if we integrate uh, lambda F1 plus 1 minus lambda F2, then indeed we get P. And as long as um, lambda varies from 0 to 1, in fact, uh, lambda doesn't even have to vary from 0 to 1. It can, be, it can be a larger number in this case. But as it varies from 0 to 1, we do indeed get... Um, we do indeed get the convexity that we advertised. So the interesting thing is that the set of all signals which have the same area under a specified orientation of a slice corresponds to a convex set. In fact, this is exactly the same as the constant area convex set because we are looking at the case where this line segment has a value of little p an area of little p, and that is an area over a specified interval of the two-dimensional system. So it is nothing more, again, than the constant area convex set. So with that, we've introduced some basic convex sets. We have introduced uh, sets which are interestingly convex. Now, what can we do with them? This is answered uh, a little bit in the next section, which talks about the projection onto convex sets. So let us talk then about projection onto convex sets and exactly what that means. It turns out for any convex set, if you have a point in the space which is external to the convex set, then there is a unique value on the convex set that is closest to Euclidean sense, in a mean square error sense. So on the bottom, we have a convex set, which is kind of a rounded rectangle. And we have an external point x. There does exist a unique point within that convex set, and that point is noted by the projection. It turns out that if the set is convex, then that projection is unique. It is not difficult to come up with non-convex sets where the projections are not unique, but in the case of convex sets, the projections are indeed unique. If you have a different point external, as you see in this next figure, then the projection is going to be different. So here in the lower right hand, we have a Y, and then we have the projection onto the convex set of Y, which is a different point than the projection onto the convex set in C. So different external points are going to have different projections uh, in general. Now what if you're already in the convex set? This next, year, this next 
slide shows a point Z which is already in the convex set. Well, the closest point in the convex set to a point in the convex set is the point. So the projection onto the convex set of Z is Z. You don't move at all. You're already in the convex set, so you're a happy camper. So those are the three examples of projections onto convex sets. Projections on the convex sets have, have a mathematical um, property called idempotence. Idempotence means if you do it twice, it's the same as doing it once. It's kind of going in and vacuuming the floor. If you go in and vacuum the floor once and then you go in and vacuum it the second time, the second time doesn't make any difference as long as you did a good, time, good job the first time you did it. So if you project onto a convex set once, then you're on the convex set, and if you project again, you're already on the convex set. This is the concept of idempotence. Let's uh, look at some example projections here. Let's go back to the three-dimensional example that we have with the box. That is signals of duration three that are bounded between an upper and a lower uh, bound. The lower bound being zero, the upper bound being u. Now on the right here, we have a box, and then we have a point external to the box. You can see on the left figure that indeed this signal is not bounded because the first element is external to the bound. The first element exceeds u, which is the maximum allowable value for the uh, convex set. So on the right, we have this picture geometrically. We have the coordinates x1, x2, and x3, and we have this signal represented as a single, sing, single point external to the convex set. Now, it's kind of obvious here what the projection onto the convex set is, as we see on the next slide. The point on the right, which is closest to the external point, is simply the closest point on the right-hand face of the box, and that is indeed what we see. Now, what, the, what does that correspond to in the signal? It simply means that the signal is clipped at the value that is too high, and it is made to conform to the upper bound. So you can see from, on the left-hand side, from the upper plot to the lower plot, that that value now has been clipped, and uh, the point has been made to conform to the box, and now it is within the convex set. So we do have that sort of idea of projection. And notice this projection is very intuitive in both senses. In the box on the, on the right, it makes sense to choose the point closest to the box. And on the left, it makes sense that if you have points external to the bound, that in order to get them into the bound, you just clip them off. You make them either equal to the upper bound if the point is too big, or the lower bound if the point is too low. How do we extend that to higher dimensions? Well, let's have a bounded signal uh, convex set wherein x of t is required to be limited between a lower value and an upper value u, lower value l, upper value u. We have a signal which is not in the convex set. How do we project onto the convex set of bounded signals? Looking at our previous result, the answer is somewhat intuitive. We simply clip that signal. So again, well, let's go back to the previous result. We take everything external to the upper value, anything greater, greater than the upper bound, set it to the upper bound. Anything smaller than the lower bound, we set it to the lower bound, and we get the clip signal, which is shown here, which turns out to obviously be in the convex set, number one. But Number two is, is determined very intuitively simply by the act of clipping. And again, in a higher dimensional space, this corresponds to taking a value of y of t and projecting it onto a hyperbox. The set of signals which are bounded lie in a box in hyperspace. What about the set of identical middles? Let's take a look at the set of middles where the third element is always equal to 1. Well, what if the element is not equal to 1, as shown here on the left? In other words, we have it looks like about a half and a half and then one and a half. Um, 
we have the corresponding geometrical interpretation on the right. Recall that the uh, convex set corresponding to identical middles was a plane which was parallel in this case to the y1, y2 plane. And we have a point which lies off of this plane. The convex set is the plane. How do we, how do we place it onto the plane? Well, clearly what we do is we take whatever the value is and we make it in this case into 1. So this is shown in the next slide. We project onto the set and on the left hand side with the signal we simply take whatever the value is uh, in this identical middle and we make it into what the identical middle is supposed to be in this case simply one so we take the value uh, at x3 and we make it into one again in both cases the interpretation is relatively intuitive we see that indeed this is what we would expect to uh, to happen This extends to higher dimensions, as we see on the next slide. We have the set of signals x of t, where x of t is equal to a constant signal over a specified interval. If we have a signal where that isn't true, such as the y of t shown on the right here, and uh, this y of t is supposed to be a constant in the middle, what is the best way to, to treat this? What is the projection onto the convex set corresponding to identical middles given by C of t? Well, the answer is uh, incredibly intuitive. All we need to do is we need to take whatever that interval is and take the signal in that interval and replace it by the known signal. And by doing so, we project onto the convex set, which again is a plane in hyperspace. Again, this projection is very intuitive and is what you would expect it to be, isn't it? If you had something which you knew was going to be some sort of function within a specified interval and it wasn't and you wanted to make it that way, well, you just replace it and put what you wanted in there. And indeed, that turns out to be the projection as we see here. Let's look at constant area signals. Now, this is a little bit uh, counterintuitive. Once you see it, it'll be clear. But I think the first thing one wants to do is to, to amplify the signal in so that it has an area. So if it doesn't have a specific area, you just multiply it by something so it has the area. That turns out to be wrong. And uh, we'll see that in this case. We're going to have a two-dimensional signal here. And we will have uh, the case where x1 and x2 are supposed to add, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, x1 and x2 are supposed to add up to 1. If x2 and x1 are supposed to add up to 1, we are going to get the convex set, which is shown here on the right-hand side. You see it's a simplex that goes between uh, 1 on the kind of the x-axis and 1 on the y-axis. So that is our required projection. Now on the left here, we have a signal, and this signal is 2 at the point n is equal to 1 is equal to 1 at the point n is equal to 2. So if we add the signal there, what do we get? We get 3, and now it's supposed to be 1. So how do we project onto the set of where the sum is equal to 1? Well, on the right here, you can see that point, and you can see the point, uh, the orange point, where it says that the vector y is not in c. It's very clear what the projection is. The projection is as you can see on this slide, is onto the line segment, which is shown uh, on the right-hand side. Now, let's look at exactly what happens in order to do that. Since this simplex is always going to be at 45 degrees, it means that in order to project on the line, we have to subtract off the same value for the first point as we do for the second point. And that, indeed, is what we do. This new point is... is uh, 1 and 0, and you can see indeed this is the case, and we have, um, we ha we, we have the projection that we uh, so desire. I look at this as kind of a water filling. You have, you have a signal here, and then you have a, you have a specified area. Here, here's your y is equal to 0 axis. What you need to do to that signal is you need to raise it or lower it to get a value of a. You leave the signal looking exactly the same but it's kind of filling up the tank and floating the ship a little bit higher or taking away water and floating it a little bit lower. And that then corresponds to, um, that then corresponds to the projection onto the set of 
constant area signals. Interesting. This indeed extends to higher dimensions. If we have a point Y, which is not into a convex set, over a specified interval, the, the area is not equal to the specified area A, we need to take that signal and we need to either raise it up or lower it down in order to get a value uh, of the signal equal to the specified value. So here's an example. On the upper hand, on the upper uh, figure, we see a signal, and it's over a specified interval t. And in this case, the area on the top is too small, so we fill the tank with water and float it up. Notice that the area on top is exactly, uh, or the shape of the function on the top is exactly the same as it was before, except we have filled it up with a DC value. Now this doesn't have to be over the entire timeline. You can specify an interval over which to do this. And if that's the case, you only raise or lower the signal over that interval. The next one is also pretty intuitive, and this is the set of band-limited signals. Suppose that you have a signal, and the signal isn't band-limited, and you want to project it onto the set of signals which is band-limited. Well, you run it through a low-pass filter. Very obvious. So that's what we do. We take a Fourier transform. We set everything outside of the bandwidth B. We set it equal to zero. And then we uh, just keep what's inside the interval from minus B to B. And we inverse transform it. And that is our projection. That's the best we can do. And again, the projection onto band-limited signals is relatively intuitive. So that's, that's very nice. What about for tomographic projections, as we see in the next slide? Well, suppose that we have a candidate image. Now, the way to think about this is as follows. We, we have this candidate image, and we, we have a bunch of projections, and this candidate image doesn't conform to the projections. So we have to update it in some ways to make it conform to the projections. And we're only going to make it conform to one projection. Later on, we'll have it conform to a number of projections. But we have one projection, and then we have this line which goes uh, this line that, that 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 goes down. Now the area over this line should be p, but it isn't equal to p. It's equal to some other value. So if we sum all the pixels, or in the continuous case, integrate along this line, uh, we're going to get a value of p which we're going to get a value which is not equal to p. In order to project onto the set of all images which have that projection being equal to p, we just raise the water level, as we see here. It's just exactly like the constant area signal. So we raise or lower the water in the middle in the candidate image until the sum is p along the specified line. And that is the corresponding projection. So let's next consider the bounded energy signal, which is a ball. And we have, the, um, we have the set of signals such that the energy in the signal is less than or equal to some value E. How do we project onto that signal? Well, first of all, if the signal is already in the ball, if you have a signal which has an energy less than E, then you just leave it alone. If, however, the energy uh, exceeds E, then we need to project onto the ball. We need to lower the energy in the signal. And we do it just by running it through an amplifier, as we, as we see here. So we run it through an amplifier, and the bottom equation is that we leave it alone if y of t is already within the ball. If it isn't in the ball, we keep the same shape of the energy, but we run it through an amplifier in order to lower it and, uh, or raise it every single point amplified by the same exact amount in order to give us an energy of E. And that's how we project onto the set of bounded energy signals. Let's, uh, let's cut it off here in terms of the introduction to convex sets. We've looked at a number of different convex sets, and we've looked at their corresponding projections. And the question is, what do we do with them? We'll find out some more of the properties of convex sets as we talk next time.